Hi, everybody. How you doing? Up there at the back in the cheap seats, the nosebleeds. This is a um, session all about preprints, and you may have noticed from the title, uh, up the, oh, it's not showing. Well, it's going to be a debate. So it's less of a didactic presentation than it is a discussion. And that will be made much better for everybody if you all stood up. Come on, stand up, please. Stand up, please. Uh, this is a polite request that you all stand up and come and sit closer to the front. Come on, come down here. Just do it. And then we can have a better time. And I'm really grateful that you um, are doing this. It's, I recognize everyone's got their comfort seats, and uh, now you're no longer in them. But I can assure you that the seats at the front are just as comfortable as the ones at the back. Thank you. Yeah, what she said. Thank you. Yeah, you're doing great. Well, thank you all so much. So we have about 90 minutes together. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here. Thank you for choosing this concurrent session. I'd also like to briefly introduce our beautiful panelists. Um, <clears throat> I'll do that a bit more fully in a minute when I introduce what they're going to talk about. Well, we have John Ingalls from Cold Spring Harbor Labs. We have Heather Tierney from COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics and the American Chemical Society. We have Debbie Sweet from Cell Press, part of Elsevier, and Howard Broman from, I'm going to murder this, Austerval Research Centre in Norway, and also a Coke Council member. Welcome to them, and welcome to you all. Um, audience participation time. We'd like to know who you are. So in the conference brochure, it says that one, two, three, four, five, six categories of people are attending this meeting. I'm going to ask you to um, put your hand up and keep it up, OK? So put your hand up and keep it up if you're a researcher. I reckon that's uh, about 10 people in a room full of about maybe 40. Keep it up, please. Are you a teacher? Put your hand up. Another five or so hands went up. Keep your hands up, everybody who already put them up. Are you a research administrator? Keep your hands up, everybody. I want everybody's hands up by the end, by the way. Um, yeah, another five or so people, so we're getting to about half of the audience, but do keep your hands up. Are you a, um, a funder or from a government agency? I saw one hand go up here. Okay, terrific. Um, everyone's been putting their hands down, so now, you know, never mind. Um, are you involved with publishing? Are you an editor or a publisher or something like that? Okay. So around about half of us, Oh, that's where I run out of categories. Did anybody not put their hand up yet? No, everyone, everyone okay, good, good. Um, so around about half of us are about our publishers, and around about the other half are the other groups that I mentioned. Thank you for that, that really helps us. The other question I would like to ask of you before we begin is, who knows what a preprint is? Kind of like about 80% of all of us. That's a good start, but there are 20% of us who don't know. So we're going to do something quite good here together. <clears throat> we're going to explore, uh, hear about and explore what preprints are and the ethics around that. Um, and we're going to do that via a bit of a debate. It's going to be quite good fun. Um, this morning we've heard quite a lot about uh, innovation, responsible innovation, and we've referred frequently to things to do with open research and open science. And that's what preprints are, really. They're kind of an innovation in open research and open science. So they fit really well on top of and around the other things that we've been discussing. And we want to explore, kind of today, through that debate, the ethics of this particular innovation, that is, preprints. We're going to start with John. Hey, John. And um, John's going to take us on a journey, where we've been with preprints and where we are right now. Sort of the history, we're all going to be able to get right up to speed with the very um, current thinking that's going on in preprints. After John, we're going to have Heather, who's going to take us through the um, ethical thinking that's been going on at COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics, around 
the ethical matters concerning preprints. And that's all background. So those of us who know about preprints, some of this will be stuff that you already know about. And the 20% of us who don't, this will be new, very useful. By that stage, we'll all be up to speed with everything that's going on, and the debate begins. So Debbie uh, Sweet from Cell Press will open the debate and argue four preprints in around about 10 minutes. Then Howard will um, offer the other side of the debate, the debate against preprints. And from there, the conversation will begin. OK, so that's the plan. Um, when the debate ends, it turns into question time. And I've got a myriad of questions for our fantastic panelists. You'll, you'll be delighted to hear. Um, but it's actually about you. So um, well, when the debate ends, I'll give you the instructions for asking questions. And we'd really like to have a conversation with you as well as between ourselves. Very good. Introduction over. I'll queue up your slides, John, and hand over. There you go. Very good. Please welcome John English. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to participate in, in this uh, meeting. Um, despite Chris's mild-mannered demeanor, he is actually a very fierce convener, so um, we're under strict instructions here. I have 10 minutes only. So, but you should just sort of regard me as the kind of amuse-bouche of this particular meal for, to be followed by the healthy appetizer of Heather and then the red meat of the debate between the other two on the platform. So um, I am this, I'm using this title because that's what our convener gave me. Um, and I can see already that this is not the version of the slides that I thought I up uploaded, but never mind. Um, I'm going to pass over that. Uh, this is a, a very brief uh, introduction to me. I do various things at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, including uh, start preprint servers, and I have uh, advisory uh, roles at other organizations. We don't need this slide because you've already shown that you all know what a preprint is. Um, Chris asked me to give a sort of account of how we got to where we are, and um, over lunchtime I reorganized this slide, and as I said, this is no longer what I was expecting to see. But essentially, we're talking, in life sciences in particular, we're talking as if preprints are new, and of course they aren't new at all. They, um, the sharing of uh, findings and ideas among scholars goes back many centuries, um, and, and that's happened in all, in all disciplines. Uh, in the 60s, actually, NIH tried to start what was, in essence, an embryonic preprint server, and we owe knowledge of this to the historian Matthew Cobb just recently, and it turned out that that didn't work. Despite a lot of prestigious support, it didn't work because journals said it shouldn't. Um, then in the 1990s, uh, the physicists began to use technology, mostly, uh, firstly, email sharing to, to uh, share preprints. Then Paul Ginsparg put it all on a more formal basis with the famous archive, uh, which is still going, of course, 27 years and 1.5 million manuscripts later. Um, Social Science Research Network actually started in 1994. And for a, a long time, it looked as if there was sort of something specific or different about these scholarly communities that made preprints work there, because there were a number of failed efforts to start preprints in medicine and in life sciences. Um, something happened in 2013. Uh, BioArchive began. I was involved in that. PRJ preprints began. Zenodo began all around the same time. I think we all sensed the, the, the currents of change in scholarly communities. And after that, the, the heavens opened. And now uh, there are many preprint servers um, of a not-for-profit kind, and in addition, there are an increasing number of journals which are exposing manuscripts that have been submitted to those journals at an early stage in the peer review process. Um, and I've, I've listed some here. So um, I had uh, uh, another version of this slide, a much more up-to-date one, which lists 45 uh, preprint servers currently, and they are still growing. Um, the volume of their output is also growing. 
Um, this is uh, data from Crossref, which shows that preprints as a format has, uh, at least judged by Crossref, uh, that has doubled in volume uh, in each of the past two or three years. And this does not include all preprints because not all preprints have DOIs. A, a large component of the growth of preprints has, I, I have to acknowledge, uh, come from BioArchive, which is growing very steadily. Uh, in the last six years, now at 51,000 manuscripts, um, we're getting about 2,500 new submissions a month and 1,000 revisions. A very large number, it's actually 300,000 authors now and 17,000 institutions and a lot of usage. And encouraged by the momentum of BioArchive, we are going to launch at the end of this month um, MedArchive, which will do attempt to do very similar things for clinical medicine. We, uh, this will also come from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, but we are managing it in partnership with Yale University and BMJ. Um, one thing I wanted to make clear, I don't have time to go into the vari variations between preprint servers, but there are many, the kind of submission requirements that are, that are made, uh, the kind of article types that are presented, the license choices that are given or not, uh, the way that manuscripts are screened, um, the kind of linking out that happens from preprints, and also the procedures involved in correcting the record, withdrawing or removing or whatever uh, procedural practice the server concerned have. Those, those things vary a lot between different uh, enterprises, and one of the things that distinguish, uh, that is a difference is whether or not a server will take a manuscript that has been published by a journal, a so-called postprint. Uh, BioArchive is one of several that say that we won't do that. Um, preprints are increasingly, I think, being integrated into the broader scholarly ecosystem in a whole variety of ways. Um, submission uh, to journals, submission from journals, linking uh, to between preprint versions and published versions. Um, Google Scholar does a terrific job of assembling all the different versions of paper, including its preprint version. And there are increasing efforts to combine uh, the discovery of preprints with the discovery of published papers. Meta is one, but there are other initiatives on, on the horizon. Um, so that's sort of where we are, briefly, with preprints. And let me just finish off by just talking a little bit about where we might go. Um, one possibility is that um, preprints will continue to grow. And we've had tremendous encouragement from funders. Uh, a number of funding organizations have strongly recommended to their, uh, their uh, researchers that they post preprints. In one case, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative mandates that everything they, they support has to be published as a preprint, or disseminated, I should say, as a preprint. Um, that could continue, that could grow. Um, the, the benefit of, of preprints is that it, dis it separates the process of dissemination of knowledge from the evaluation of that knowledge which is, a, by, in its essence, a much slower process. So if all funding agencies mandated the posting of preprints, what we would get to is a goal that has been so much discussed for the last 10 years, namely universal access to recent research findings. And our, the argument that my colleague Richard Sever, Mike Eisen, and I make in a paper that's going to be published tomorrow is that this would provide this universal access at low cost, and it would also allow journals to focus on the vitally important work of peer review and do so in ways that are slower, more thoughtful, and maybe even discipline specific, because bio bioinformatics is not necessarily the same in terms of peer review as cancer research. Um, <clears throat> Right now, as you all know, research evaluation relies extremely heavily, if not exclusively, on journal peer review. And we all know the endless cycle of revision and resubmission and so on. Preprints enable new forms of research evaluation. And um, here we have 
uh, uh, several um, several projects that uh, are essentially assessment unsolicited by um, uh, independent websites. Like I said, these slides are not the ones that I prepared. Um, so pre-lights, uh, pre-review and bi-overlay are independent websites looking at preprint servers, picking out uh, in particularly important uh, papers and providing commentary and assessment of that work. Um, sometimes uh, there are other projects, a growing number of them, in which the authors submit their manuscript for journal independent uh, assessment and what essentially is portable peer review. So from the process of working with peer community in, for example, they get a set of reviews that they can then take to a journal with the hope that the journal will um, look kindly on these particular uh, reviews. And a, a, a sort of further expression of that idea is the so-called overlay journal where the preprint remains on a preprint server, the journal makes its evaluation, does its peer review, and essentially badges the preprint as uh, having been accepted uh, by that particular journal. The best known example of that is discrete analysis, the mathematics journal. Um, journal independent peer review, um, I think I've talked about that really already. So, um, we, as I said, re uh, journal peer review dominates the process of research evaluation. Um, preprints are helping to catalyze change in that process. And the task for us in the future will be to find a way of integrating all of these different ways of looking at recent research uh, with the goal of evaluating the work concerned and the scientists who are the scholars uh, who have done it. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Wow, you stuck to time like um, really well. Um, very good. Heather, you're up. Um, the floor, let me help you with the slides. That shouldn't be your job. Uh, can you see them? Oh, on the end. Yep. There you go. Thank you. Are you okay? Yeah. Good. Um, just not, oh, there they are. So welcome to Heather. Off you go. Thanks, everyone. Um, as Chris said, I work for the American Chemical Society in my day job, so just as full disclosure, ACS is a co-founder and co-owner of the preprint server Chem Archive, but I do not work directly with them. Uh, and actually today, I'm delighted to be here representing COPE, or the Committee on Publication Ethics, as a COPE council member. As John said, preprints are not new in many fields where they've been around for decades in physics and mathematics, but really the discussion about preprint preprints and ethics is pretty new, where really just in the past few years, COPE has started being approached about what are the ethical considerations that people should be thinking about, uh, particularly from the journal and publisher side, but just generally surrounding ethics and preprints. So in the spring of last year, March 2018, COPE did put out a discussion document following several discussions that COPE held with members, first uh, in the COPE forum and then also in a couple of se seminars really thinking about what are the issues that editors and publishers need to be thinking about when they're making their own policies surrounding preprints. This is very much a discussion document. It is not a guidance document. It probably raises many more questions than it answers, but it does set out a lot of questions for publishers and editors to think about when they are trying to create their own policies, which again, in some of these fields that are really just starting to experience preprint servers or arising in their discipline. This is something new that, that journals uh, are trying to deal with. Uh, and the document does set out a few recommendations for journals, publishers, as well as preprint platforms and authors. And it's good that uh, Chris saw that we have about half of our audience's publishers and editors. I am going to go through a few, uh, uh, pretty quickly go through some of the ethical questions that are raised, which really are aimed at uh, the, the wide majority of the COPE uh, membership is journals and editors. Um, so we'll go through a few of the questions that you can check out more in the COPE discussion document if you're interested. But uh, several of the questions 
or several of the discussions that we've had really are based around our preprints publications. And there's really hearty debate on both sides of this where they really look like article publications in many ways, the content, the scope, even the, the format that they are posted in looks very similar to an article. Many preprint servers use DOIs, but whether they count as a publication or not really varies by discipline. But many disciplines do not consider them publications in the way that they would prevent later peer review at a journal. Another question that's come about is, do preprints establish precedence? And most many fields would say yes. And if they do establish precedent, though, that really sets out a, a role for readers and authors where authors need to know, they need to be following preprint servers in order to know what the literature is, in order to be able to understand where precedent has already been set. And also raises questions about citations to preprints Authors should be citing them if they have uh, a precedent set, and also how preprints are cited in the literature as being non-peer-reviewed sources. What happens to a preprint if the work is sub subsequently published in a journal? We expect in most cases that a preprint would be posted and eventually it would get published in a journal somewhere. In most cases, we would expect the preprint would exist in perpetuity. It wouldn't get taken down just because it's also been published in a journal. Uh, both the paper and the preprint then benefit from linking, like John discussed. But there are questions that come up about what happens if concerns are raised about the latter published article, or if the article ends up being corrected or retracted, how do we know what's happened to the article on the preprint? As more and more preprint servers have come about, there's also questions about can papers be posted on multiple preprint platforms? And in a lot of places, there aren't clear guidelines. And as we see more and more servers coming about, this becomes a question, especially for very multidisciplinary work, could an author post the same uh, preprint in multiple servers that serve very different communities? And finally, what are the license implications of posting on a preprint platform? And this really varies by the platform, and this really comes down to authors needing to be aware of what they're signing up for when they're using uh, preprint servers and what that might mean in terms of publishing with a journal. As I mentioned, there are some recommendations in the discussion document for journals, publishers, platforms and authors, and really to summarize all of them, transparency is key. Everybody just needs to be pretty transparent about what their policies are. Specifically, journals should have clear and publicly posted policies surrounding preprints, whether they allow them, whether they have specific rules about when uh, a paper can be posted on a preprint server before, after, or during peer review. Publishers need to consider processes to link preprints to published articles and be very clear about their licensing policies. Preprint servers should clearly mark their content to indicate that if it has undergone peer review, again, in most cases it, it won't have, but make that clear. And authors need to make themselves aware of preprint and journal policies. I mentioned specifically re regarding licensing, but just generally make sure they're aware of the policies that the different platforms and journals they're uh, using subscribe to. That's really it from me. I will say there is a new version of this document coming soon. We've already received a lot of feedback about the COPE discussion document. Um, later this year, there will be a new version based on the, the uh, feedback we've already received. But if you do have any more feedback about either the current version or the new version coming out later this year, please do send it along to COPE, and we will incorporate that into future versions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Right now, here's where it starts hotting up, right? The debate begins. Yes. Um, the debate's intended to be a bit of fun. Uh, let's see how much fun it is. Okay. Debbie, over to you. Yeah, so how do, do I advance with this or with this? Okay. Are you happy? Yeah, I just, I, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll work with that. 
Okay, fine. Okay, great. Okay. Hi. Hello. This is where it's supposed to get more lively. Hopefully it will. Um, I'm Deborah Sweet. I'm the VP of Editorial at Cell Press. And um, Cell Press is part of Elsevier. So, and full disclosure, SSRN, the preprint server, is also part of Elsevier. But I'm going to use examples in my talk specifically from BioArchive. So, my job here is to convince you and excite you about the idea that preprints can pay, play a really positive role in helping to promote research integrity. I'm going to do that largely by talking you through a few examples of where I think they already have. Um, and I'm going to lean very heavily on biomedical science because that's the field that I know. Okay, first one. This is the kind of easy one to sort of get you into the mood. So um, I think preprints can form a record of the form of a paper that went before peer review. I mean, you probably all know that preprints are meant, intended to be posted ahead of submission so that you can get feedback from the community before you actually submit your paper. So I'm going to look, show you an example from one of our journals, Cell Systems, where there was an article that was posted as a preprint in about November 2017. And then as she submitted to the journal in April the following year and eventually published in September, and Quincy, who's the editor of Cell Systems, has been really trying to promote illustrating the value of peer review and good peer reviews. And so this is the, was the first article she chose for her new article type called Peer Review, where she takes one of the peer reviews of the paper and then publishes it as a sort of commentary type article. So the goal is to give the reviewers credit for the great review that they wrote. And to help her with this, she referred back to the preprint to show everyone who was reading the peer review what the peer review was actually about, because the preprint was the original version. There's no real issue here in terms of integrity, but you could, it does help show what the peer review process brought. And also, if there was a problem later on, you would have a reference point of the preprint to go back to and see what was being discussed. Okay. Next one. This is where they get a little more interesting. So, one example of using preprints to kind of counter criticism of a published paper and then actually adjust claims. This is a paper from Craig Venter. It was a paper published in PNAS where they said that um, they made a claim, pretty bold claim, that based on people's genome sequence, they can predict what their face will look like. Quite a, quite a bold claim. Um, this got a lot of press coverage, much discussion, um, but then at the same time, you know, pretty much the next day, someone who disagreed with what they were saying, their algorithms posted a preprint, um, this is uh, early, I think, yeah, he posted a preprint saying, I disagree with their calculations, I think they basically over, really overreached here and said something they shouldn't have done. A lot of blog posts, a lot of, lot of coverage of this topic as well, uh, much discussion online, it was very active, there was, lot, there was a Nature news piece about it about a week later, talking about the discussion that was going on, and then also, the and there's a lot of discussion on Twitter. I mean, preprints get discussed a lot on Twitter. And actually, the first author got a little bit upset about this. And so this is a good reminder that if we are going to have a lot of public discussion like this, we should try to keep it polite and, and positive. And in the end, um, the Venter Group uh, put up a preprint themselves a little about a week later again. It first went up on a sort of in September, and then there was a modified version in October. And I think there was a through the discussions that they had about the preprint from Ehrlich and then their own preprints, they adjusted their claims and they sort of, they were trying to argue that there wasn't an issue with their algorithm, but at the same time they did back off what they were saying about the really being able to predict the face and they said, well, actually it can predict a lot of things and sort of facial features is one of them, but there's other things as well. So they, they changed their, what they were saying about their paper based on the discussion they had in the preprint forum. And I don't know, I don't think that if, these, if the preprint forum hadn't been available to be able to have this debate, I don't think that would have happened. Especially not so quickly. Next one, rapid communication of some contradictory results. This is an example from the stem cell field, which is one that I know pretty well because I used to do a, run a journal that works on that. This is about um, correction of um, gene editing in human embryos, which is obviously a hot button topic as well. This is an article that came out from the Metalopov lab in Nature. Um, pretty soon after that, that came out in August, and then um, pretty soon after that, a competing lab published on BioArchive a preprint where they said that they felt that the interpretation in the Metalopov paper about what the, exactly what was going on in terms of editing wasn't quite correct. 
So they put that online in August. Um, clearly they communicated with Nature because in October Nature put up a notice saying, well, there's some discussion going on about this paper. And then in August the following year, so a year after the original paper came out, the, the paper about from the competing group saying that they think the interpretation was needed some revision, I came out in Nature. Most journals have a mechanism like this for talking about you know, when there's someone has a challenge or disagrees with the paper, but I know from personal experience for having dealt with these things that it takes a very long time to move them through. I mean, they're difficult, they're contentious, there's lots of discussion. So although Nature, I'm sure, went through a very rigorous process here, the fact that BioArchive, the preprint server was available and a place to put the, the original, the related work meant that the whole discussion was out in the open a lot more quickly than it would have been otherwise and so people who were looking at this work could also look at the different interpretation. This one, data problems. This is another kind of, uh, this is another one that ended up with a lot of public discussion. It's about um, tardigrades. How many, how many of you even know what a tardigrade is? Yep. They're pretty cool. They're, they're, they're these amazing organisms that are really robust. They can, they can survive temperature and chemicals and all sorts of things. They're tiny little things, but they're very tough. So there's been a number of groups working on looking at their genome to see if they can work out you know, what's so special about tardigrades. Um, and a paper came out in PNAS talking about the tardigrade genome and arguing that the, um, one of the very unique features of it is there's a lot of genes that have come in from, you've got the tardigrade genome, a lot of genes have come in from other species like bacteria to sort of uh, boost the tardigrade genome. That came out. Um, other groups were also working on the tardigrade genome and they really disagreed with this conclusion and pretty quickly they posted on BioArchive that they felt that, that this conclusion was basically wrong, that the, the idea that these genes are coming in is just not correct. Um, there was a lot more discussion. That paper got published in PNES um, in March the following year. Um, more, more articles, more discussion, uh, lots of discussion. This was a very big debate. Um, in the end, it turned out also that, um, and I think the debate got speeded up a lot by the fact that the, the original articles came out on BioArchive. Bio in the end, it turned out what had happened was that the, the authors of the original paper, and this came out quite quickly. The authors of the original paper had actually uploaded the wrong version of their genome <coughs> sequences. So they'd uploaded a version that was really kind of, um, was really messy and had a lot of bacterial sequences in it. And so the people who were criticizing them thought that that was what they were using for their conclusions, but actually they argued that it wasn't. I'm not actually 100% sure how, how this is really resolved, because I think the original authors still stick by their conclusions. But you'll notice that the correction where they said that they've uploaded a new version of the data didn't come out for you know, well over a, um, almost a year, was November to August, almost a year, whereas the discussion based on the preprints happened a lot earlier. So. You'll, get, you'll see a theme here. I mean, the main point is that if you have the preprints available, this gives you a much faster way to look at um, issues that come up with papers and promote research integrity. So, this is my summary slide. You can think about the, uh, I've been through the top four, but I really want you to think about, think about the ways in which preprints could really help contribute to this process and contribute to research integrity. I went through the top four, recording what a paper is like before peer review, allowing authors to counter criticism and respond to discussion very publicly and quickly, speedily talk about contradictory results instead of waiting for the normal peer review process to move through, and then also highlighting problems with data analysis that actually help the authors understand what's wrong with their paper and then fix it. Three that I didn't talk about, give examples of, but they're also really relevant helping authors to refine their paper before they submit. I mean, as I said, the point of a preprint is to put it online and get some feedback. So if you, can, if you see, if someone of your colleagues sees a problem, then you can fix it before you even submit. Negative results. We talk a lot about it's really great, would be really great if negative results could be more out there, integrity would be better, we'd all understand what was going on. Nobody wants to make the effort to publish negative results, or very rarely, but if you have a preprint server, you can put them up there and they're available to the community. And then also validation and confirmation. We talk a lot about reproduction, reproducibility, people doing, showing that they can do the same study. That's also pretty hard to publish, but it's, a preprint server is a great home for that, and it's a really good way of showing that research is reproducible and we can, you know, that um, it's reported correctly and we can stand by and move forward. So, lastly, this is something that came up at a, I went to a science and technology policy meeting a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. 
And one of the discussions during the, um, the preprint session when it came up was like, well, imagine, think about some of the papers that you know that turned out to be really problematic. I mean, the one that came up as an example was the Arsenic Life paper, but there have been plenty of others as well. Prominent papers that ended up getting um, pretty rapidly um, criticized and, and uh, after they came out. And imagine what it would have been like if one of those papers was online as a preprint, first of all. The people would have had a chance to comment on it. I mean, some of these most prominent, paper, most prominent pieces of work would have had comments immediately. They would have been all over Twitter. And they probably, we probably wouldn't have got to the point where we would have had the same kind of issues with them being published and then having to adjust them afterwards. So maybe that's the way that preprints could really, if everything was a preprint, maybe we'd end up with a situation like that instead. Thanks. Thank you so much. So we've had the first half of our debate, and now we have Howard coming to represent the other side of the story. Let's find your slides, Howard. There they are. Terrific. All good? Thank you. Okay, yep. over to you. Thanks. So the other side of the story, uh, rather than say con or against, I uh, landed on skepticism. So the uh, little person on the left, on your left, uh, is your reminder to apply uh, skepticism, and uh, the famous personage on the right is your reminder that organized skepticism is a fundament of knowledge generation. Okay, so um, we've already heard about the benefits of preprints. This is a partial list, and I won't have time to go through all of them here. Um, you can read them for yourself uh, while I'm talking. Uh, I'll be selective in the slides that come about which ones I deal with, but uh, they're kind of up here uh, because there'll be time after, so they may come up during the debate. So key concerns or challenges about preprints. Uh, safety is uh, written three times on this slide. So peer review re removes, even, though, even with all of its problems, Peer review removes more errors and unvetted claims than no review at all. Um, and incorrect and overstated inferences, with my editor's hat on, I can say, are more and more common uh, in manuscripts that we receive uh, for assessment uh, at journals. Safety number two, mul there are multiple competing versions, all of which are citable of what without careful and informed examination appears to be the same content, the preprint version of which is much more likely to contain errors and unvetted claims. And these all persist in perpetuity. Safety number three, uh, presently, although we've heard some allusions to this, uh, it's unclear who's responsible for updating the preprint server version, uh, nor to link it to the final published version or a uh, correction or statement of concern. Uh, in terms of uh, the pace of uh, discovery, um, this is an interesting uh, histogram uh, on the x-axis is the age of preprint at publication in a journal uh, after deposition on a preprint server with the uh, numbers on the y-axis and the takeaway message is it's, uh, the median is 166 days uh, after uh, deposition on a preprint server, with many much shorter and a few uh, much longer. Um, I can say, at least in my field, uh, this is an insignificant delay in terms of the pace of discovery. Um, in, in, in ecology and marine science, you know, the pace of discovery is years to decades. Um, I would argue and ask you to think about, maybe this will provoke some debate, that we could view this uh, need to immediately publish your manuscript as, you, as soon as you think it's ready as part of the instant gratification culture that we're living in today. We need everything now on our phones immediately whenever we're ready to do it. I would also argue that we should consider that this feeds into the fake news uh, world that we're living in. We should be cautious. So there's another risk. So do preprints really accomplish their mission? Um, critical comments in advance of publication. This has been, you've heard this from everybody here. Um, just looking at this, trying to get some numbers about it, uh, I found only 8 to 25% uh, get com commented on, and the majority of those comments are not substantive. So we've heard some really great cases, but 
they're, the, they're a minority, <laughs> to say the least. And I would also say, with my editor's hat on, we should ask ourselves, why would a higher percentage of authors adopt critical comments on their preprint when they very often do not uh, during formal peer review? We've all know stories where authors circulate manuscripts that they have submitted to one journal, receive very valid criticism, and send it to another journal without making any changes at all. Pace of discovery, I've already talked about. Mitigating positive outcome bias, that's a very good one. Um, so we can say possibly it does, uh, but are preprints the only or the best solution to that? Uh, one could make other present other possible solutions to that. Transparency. We can ask how does allowing potentially error-ridden manuscripts presenting overstated inferences and conclusions to improve, uh, how will that improve transparency to the typical reader, and particularly to the non-expert non reader? So the risk of freely available unvetted documents uh, I would ask, given the limited time that's saved and the limited improvement to most of them, is it really worth it? So just uh, a quick list of some other concerns or challenges from the perspectives of different stakeholders that we can use as a launch pad for the debate that will follow this. The loss of novelty, one can think about, that is, on submission of a preprint to a journal. It's really can't argue that it's novel anymore. It's already out there for everybody to read for free in perpetuity. Not all journals will accept manuscripts that are already available as preprints. Citation confusion, which is the version of record and when. Um, impact on credibility and public perception of science. I go back to the immediate publication of an unvetted document feeding into uh, fake news. Uh, it adds to information overload. There's many versions of the same information out there. And it adds to the author's workload. For journal editors, you can ask, I think fairly ask, if a piece of work is already out there in the public domain and has been community peer reviewed on a preprint server, or mostly not, and has a digital object identifier and is searchable and citable forever, then why should the volunteer editors of a journal and the reviewers use their time to do that all over again? And why would a publisher who at least up until recently, their existence is based on publishing original content, republish it. For journals and publishers, possible publishing and access rights conflicts, duplicate and redundant publication. So I think we'll have to rethink at least what our definitions of that is and has been. Plagiarism, I think we'll also have to revisit our definition of plagiarism since the text of a uh, Preprint is likely to match what's submitted to a journal, which many of which run routine plagiarism checks. Loss of originality, well, what originality means will have to be revisited. Loss of newsworthiness, once it's out there on a preprint server, the, the news services can and do pick it up. There are multiple versions, so there's version confusion and citation confusion. And who's responsible, I already said, for corrections and expressions of concern or retractions. So I'll leave you with this uh, provocative question. Is post-publication review the future? Preprints are becoming more and more like peer-reviewed publications, at least some of them. We've already heard about that. These are two examples that were mentioned by John. Are preprint servers the mega journals of the future? And will pre-publication peer review become rare? And with that, we can debate. Okay, this is where we switch to, aha, the microphone is on. Is the microphone on? Yeah, you can, yeah, yeah, great. This is where we switch to discussion mode. So thank you, Howard, for being a brave fellow and taking on the uh, arguments against preprints. I think it's really good to hear those arguments. I'm sure that we all agree, because if you've got an itch, like the itch to launch a new preprint server in medicine, for example, it's very hard not to scratch it. Right? And, um, and Howard's given us some food for thought there about, well, at least why we might pause and consider what's going on when we um, encourage more and more and more preprints and whether those itches are itches that we should scratch or maybe that we should refrain from scratching. So um, let's, let's 
start with a question from me for everybody. Okay, it's a question about unintended consequences. <clears throat> and imagine that you're four preprints in this instance. What unintended consequences, like bad outcomes, can you foresee? Well, well if we continue to scratch that itch and launch more preprint servers. Particularly asking to those who are arguing or already predisposed towards preprints, because this will be kind of reversing your thinking. H how would you respond to that? Uh, well, I, I mean, there's a potential, if people forget about the fact that these articles haven't been peer reviewed and start treating them as though they have, then that would be really bad. I mean, it's one of the, I, I find it sort of, you know, it, I, I worry a little bit that maybe I came across as, you know, n not valuing peer review. I really value peer review, I think it's incredibly important. So I think that that would be a potential unintended consequence. If that became the, the normal way to publish, then people might just sort of say, oh yeah, peer review, we do that, but it doesn't really matter. So I think that would, could be a problem. <laughs> Anyone want to add to that, please? Yeah, I hate to say this with John sitting next to me, but uh, this has come up a bunch of times uh, in the feedback we've received at COPE about, specifically in medicine with clinical trials, if physicians specifically aren't paying attention to the fact that something is not peer-reviewed and take this as the word of, that something is published, that this is out there, then it could be a, actually a public health threat at that point. And John as well then, very good, thank you. So, uh, like Debbie, um, I think that those of us who are involved in preprint servers actually consecrate peer review, possibly even more so than, than journal editors do, because um, that is the gold standard. It's not perfect by any means, and there's vast amounts of improvement that could be made in the various processes of peer review. Um, one question that always comes up is, should, I mean, the, 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 we all know the strain that peer review is putting the research community under, um, is it appropriate to review every single communication that a scientist shares with the world or a scholar shares with the world? Um, I think that the rise of preprint servers puts that question very much in the forefront. Um, not everything is important to everyone. And one of the purposes of journal-based peer review in the future I think, could well be to pick out and curate the most important work, the most significant um, advances, and, and explain to the community at large what that significance is and, and, and uh, what the implications are for a particular field. Um, but the, uh, to, go, to go back to an earlier point, uh, you know, we shouldn't um, forget that uh, peer, you know, let's mention the word Andrew, uh, the phrase Andrew Wakefield and autism. That was a paper that was published in The Lancet after peer review. So, um, journal publication has its failures and its faults, but um, the, the purpose of a preprint server is to allow the sharing of work, uh, as Howard said, when an author feels that it's appropriate. And the, if you look at the sort of five million accesses that we get on BioArchive every month, there's a gigantic number of pairs of eyes looking at that work. Um, to Howard's point about the public availability of, of reaction to it, at the moment about 10% of the manuscripts on BioArchive have publicly available comment. But we talk to authors all the time who say that the bulk of the reaction that they receive comes to them privately by email or by personal conversation. And that leads to a whole other question about why people aren't more willing to share their criticisms publicly. We can talk about that too. But um, I think that we, I think that the unintended consequences in some ways of journal publishing are worse than the unintended consequence of preprint uh, so, posting. So that's, that's interesting because you've just flipped it, which was my next um, question to the panel. Let's do that question the other way around. And Howard, you, you're welcome to respond to this first, but you may choose not to. If you're, uh, let's pretend we're skeptics now, um, um, and that we, you know, we're imagining the, mm, imagining 
<clears throat> that we've been persuaded and we're thinking about the damage that it could be uh, caused by actually not embracing preprints, by continuing to be skeptics. Can you, can you, does that, is that question clear enough? Can you, can you speak a bit to that? The damage that might be caused by not embracing yeah, preprints? Yeah. Mm, I wouldn't be the right person to ask that question. <laughs> okay then. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can, I can come up with like all these benefits. I think there are other systems that have already, for example, you know, that people receive comments privately. Well, you know, students go to conferences and present their uh, research at conferences and get lots of comments from the audience uh, after the conference, which supposedly, uh, well, I know for me, always uh, improves the work before you submit it to a journal. So there already were, um, you know, uh, mechanisms to accomplish the same objective that were not uh, fraught with these uh, risks. Mm. Thank you. Another couple of comments from the panel, please, and then we'll do something with the audience. Can I yeah, please do. John. Um, I, I mean, to Howard's point, it, ab absolutely. Um, w one of the reasons that Cold Spring Harbor was very receptive to the idea of a preprint server was because for 80 years we have people, we've had people coming to our campus for, for meetings and the sharing that takes place in our auditorium is absolutely vital to career development, to professional advancement and so on. So we, when we were imagining BioArchive, we imagined it as an online extension of what happens in our auditorium. It's not as the, the, the feedback, the interactivity, as it were, is not as effective publicly as we would like it to be. But it, but it is happening, as Debbie said, it's happening on Twitter and it's happening... Yeah. Press, uh, so I, I totally John. understand that. I think that if we come back to the focus about, say, you know, clinical trials or um, uh, work that goes to public health or public policy, right? Uh, in, the, in the context of a, of a conference, Cold Spring Harbor or another conference, you're talking to a room of peers who kind of un, have an inherent understanding, experience, knowledge base that they can use to filter the information. When you put a document out on a preprint server, it's available to the whole world. They don't necessarily have that filter to look at it. So it's, uh, that's, that's what I uh, think people need to consider. Uh, in addition, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but you know my kind of cursory look at preprints is it's not entirely uh, evident that they're preprints. You have to look. It's a small print, it's grayed out, there's no watermark on every page that says this is an unvetted, unpeer-reviewed document. Am I wrong about that? Um, well, you're, you're, not, you're not wrong that um, the um, mark of a preprint does not appear on every, on every page, that's true. Um, we think, we thought, or think that um, the badging of, on, on an individual article, on the uh, abstract uh, page of an individual article, um, is sufficient. Um, in the case of MedArchive, it's much bolder and brighter and bigger for obvious reasons. Um, and, I, you know, I'm quite sure that we can always do better. Uh, and we're, we're totally open to that. Thank you both. Keep going. Yeah, yeah I, I, would, I think, well, I was going to say two things. One is that I think I've seen enough examples of people saying that their research was speeded up by having something available on the preprint server, first of all, and they were able to sort of reference it and contact the author and collaborate with them, stuff like that, for me to be convinced that there is a productive role there. One thing I do want to say, though, is I think in relation to your point about the stamping, which is a negative one, is I think this, there's, a tent, there's a move now to try and make not just PDS, but you know, sort of uh, machine-readable preprints, machine that I think does run the risk of it being very hard to determine which information has been peer-reviewed and which information hasn't. If it's all sort of going into the the, the sort of you know, the, the large data sink. So, and I, th I think we're moving towards that, and I, and I do worry about that, that people won't so pick up that this comes from a preprint and therefore won't be able to differentiate. So we're talking about labelling, but also labelling in the ways that machines can interpret. Yeah. Um, Heather, you addressed transparency uh, when you shared some things from COPE. Um, what would you add to the, to the discussion right now? I was actually going to go in a completely different direction, but I was going to say in terms of not embracing preprints, we've been hearing for, well, probably decades at this point that from a really practical business perspective that, you know, electronic media and open access is going to overtake publishers. We're not going to be able to publish journals anymore. 
and we're talking about preprints here, you've mentioned preprints as being an innovation, and we in the publishing, in the scholarly communication community should be open to exploring new ways of putting out content. Preprints is one way to think about that. We've heard both sides of it, but we should at least be willing to explore that option from a business perspective. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Well, let's pause for a moment. I'm sure there's much more that we could uh, add to that discussion. And it's time to um, ask you all for some questions. But before we do that, I'd like to poll the room. Well, it's another show of hands, so nothing frightening. We're going to do first show of hands for preprints, who's currently convinced that preprints are the way to go. Um, and then a show of hands. Oh, right. OK, very good. Sorry, I was going to describe the other sides of the votes, but you know, carry on. So who's for preprints? Uh, I'm guessing that's, you know, let's call it a little under half of the room. Would that say fair to you? So we say 40% of us. All right, then. And who's against preprints? Uh, a, a smaller number by far. I mean, I would say f like a few percent of so the room. So I guess there's a bunch of uncontrolled people. And who's <laughs> <laughs> oh, the remainder? Presumably, you're undecided. Who's undecided on the fence? It's a good place to be. All right, you don't have to. You know, feel shy about that. And people in the balcony too. So I'm um, actually the same number of people, roughly speaking, who are against raise their hands. So there are people in the room who didn't raise their hands, by my estimation, and that's okay too. Right. Thank you. So um, I will repeat your comments so the room can hear it, and that will lead on to the sort of the instructions for questions. Um, nobody else could hear that. So the question was that it's more nuanced than a yes, no, undecided sort of vote. And perhaps we'll get into a discussion about there are some disciplinary differences where preprints are, you know, there's lower risk and uh, other disciplines where preprints are at higher risk, and we can come to that. So thank you for raising that point. Um, the instruction for questions, please, we'd love to, um, you to come to the microphones and to uh, identify yourself. And then, um, uh, just like Lex was saying, um, <laughs> ask a short question or make a short point, that's okay. It doesn't necessarily have to be a question. It could be something for the panel to respond to. But what um, Lex kept saying was, try not to start your own lecture. So um, <laughs> that would be appreciated. So please. Um, First question from the floor, please. Uh, over to you, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Gunter Eisenbach. I'm from Jamia Publications. And uh, we are running a preprint server for about 10 years, in a sense that we push um, submitted manuscripts on that preprint server. Um, so I find it interesting that you have a debate on preprints without even making an attempt to define what preprints are. So, I mean, I heard several, or in, in John's slides, uh, which you showed for like 10 seconds, um, it said something like preprint is something that's before su formal submission to a journal, or preprints are non peer reviewed papers. Um, but <laughs> the fact is that most of the papers on BioArchive or other preprint servers do not meet this definition because they are either simultaneously submitted to a journal or they're still on a preprint server and are already published. And that's where, in my opinion, the problem starts. So, and... Can you um, come to a conclusion, <laughs> please? So the question is, what are preprints? And how do, you, how do you view preprints? Is it a record, a scholarly record, which should not be extinguished? Or is it something that can be withdrawn by the author? Uh, I know that in BioArchive, for example, if an author says, yeah. I, want, I want to have this removed, it's yeah. not that easy. Think, On the other hand, so. authors may submit it to a journal, may get feedback, and may realize. Lex was so good about doing this. He said, he said something so polite and quite funny to stop the question, because I think we got the question. <laughs> the question is, what's a preprint? <coughs> right? And how does it differ from the version of record? And and we can turn that over to the panel. Does that fairly reflect your question? Yeah, because we have authors who, for example, ask us to make changes in the yeah. published preprint. Like, they want to have an author added, or they want to have corrections added, but our position is, no, there's a scholarly, uh, Very good. scholarly record. We should not change it. I think it. we got it. On the other we hand, it. we also realize preprints are not peer-reviewed. There may be errors in it, and maybe we should change it. Yeah. Thank you for clearly explaining your question. It's a really great question. 
So let's talk about permanence. And this is there are ethical issues and integrity issues to permanence, because if something has been said and then disappears, well, you know, did, was it ever said? Can you ever disappear anything on the internet? You know, really? Really? So um, let's talk about permanence um, and the definitions of a preprint. Who would like to go first? John, over to you. Um, I, I'm not sure I heard quite all of the points you were making. I, I apologize. And I also apologize for not being clearer, because I did have a slide that attempted to define what a preprint is, which very simply is a, a, manuscript, a research manuscript that has not been certified by peer review by a journal. Um, that does not mean to say that it has not been peer reviewed. It may have been, but it was peer reviewed by a journal and rejected. Um, on the other hand, it may, that manuscript may never have been submitted to a journal. Um, and it may, that may happen at some point in, in, in the future. To your point about, I think you, the point you were making about changes, um, all preprint servers allow versioning. So authors are uh, permitted to change the manuscript anytime they want to, and they do. 30% of the 51,000 manuscripts on BioArchive have been uh, versioned at least once. And the, the, the motivation for the versioning may be uh, very diverse. It might be in response to comments, public or private. It may be because the, the authors discovered errors. Um, they can update that, um, that, that communication at any time they want. They can also withdraw it. That doesn't mean to say that it disappears because the internet does never forget. And even if we were foolish enough to withdraw it, to remove it from BioArchive, Mr. Google will always find it. So we have, a, we have a set of procedures which we follow for a variety of reasons and we attach withdrawal notices to manuscripts if we find malfeasance, if the authors no longer have confidence in their, in their papers, for example. So, so thank you, John. So I think that addressed some of your points. We will hear from everybody else, and I can see questions lining up. So what we'll do when we've heard from those who want to um, add to that is we'll hear like three questions and then we'll address those questions um, together. Okay, so we're gonna do that in a minute, so be ready for that. Um, uh, more responses to the permanence and definitions, please, um, from those who wish to make them. I can just comment really briefly about the permanence. Uh, this is a question that came up a lot when we were talking at COPE about if preprints count as publications because, well, that we're the Committee on Publication Ethics and if we were to count preprints as publications, then maybe we should consider the COPE retraction guidelines in, in terms of should content ever be taken down. And COPE's position for published articles is that they should almost never be taken down once they've been published. There are very limited exceptions to that where legally necessary or where something would public, uh, pose a public health threat. But in, I think in a lot of cases that those kind of exceptions exist for preprints. I think there are some servers that have other reasons that they would allow withdrawal, maybe within 24 hours or something like that. But again, I think uh, COPE's guidance there was just, again, for a preprint pre platform to be very clear about when and if they would ever take anything down. Very good. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, I think it's, I, I, I can see why you might need to make exceptions, but you might be able to label it withdrawn or something, you know, because it's not really, Attractive when it hasn't been published in the first place, but it's kind of you know, withdrawn. But I do think, especially with the push for to try and uh, try and ask journals to sort of encourage people to upload preprints at the time of submission, which is happening. I mean, I think authors can end up not really realizing that's what they were agreeing to do. Yeah. So I think we do need to have mechanisms if they haven't chosen to do it to sort of be able to stop mm. stop it. Thank you. How would you like to add? No, I thought probably not. So it seems to me that um, the question re revolves around the sort of the absence of uniform. Mm, of standards right, around things like permanence, withdrawals, versioning, around the very definition of a preprint server. And maybe, although John, you explained it quite eloquently, maybe that is not a publicly understood and shared definition for a preprint. Well, it's um, something that's evolving very rapidly as well, and especially yes. with, and with so many preprint services as well. I mean, it's, you know, 40, I mean, it's, so they're all, yep. it, it's, a, it's a rapidly evolving space, and so we are gonna have to, about these things, yeah. And it does feel a bit like the Wild West, doesn't it? 
And, and that brings with it the kinds of risks that Howard has yeah. so eloquently presented to us. So let's hear um, the next, uh, shall we go for two questions, just because otherwise we're going to lose track. So if we could hear from your question first, please introduce yourself and offer the question or the comment, yes. and then we'll go over here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anke van Ekelen. I'm a medical editor of, uh, uh, of Respirology. Um, for me to really understand the value of preprint, I would like to um, better understand the discoverability. It might be, uh, you might be able to make a preprint available very quickly online, but um, I'm assuming that it's not indexed like um, a version of record after peer review by a journal. So, although it is present very quickly online, is it also yeah. discovered quickly enough mm. to serve the role that you have in mind for preprints? Very good. So that's one question about discoverability and speed via indexing in the various kinds of index. Thank you so much for that. And one more question from over here, and then we'll answer them both. I'm Slavka Baroninkova, publication lead, former publication lead, and now collaborative research lead from Takeda. So I'm actually representing uh, industry here, and um, we were really discussing a lot about use of the preprints, and I believe that is coming to the type of the research you are going to disclose on the preprint server. Bioarchive of now coming the MedArchive, because if we are, if you would like to, just for you to understand that publications or period publications, the clinical trial is a safe harbor, meaning you go with a new indication that is not yet existing, you are publishing a phase three trial, and we, you need to have only version of record for this because there is a Good. regulatory discussion. So I just try to say that even with MedIHive, we are having a lot of discussion how to use preprints and whether it is ethical and legally responsible to do so. Thank you. So I think your comment relates to industry-funded research. Presumably, no, no, no any clinical research, where research that is having the impact on a human where, human being. Where, okay, where peer-reviewed publication gives the kind of communication of that research legal safe harbour, and where the absence of peer review no longer does, opening up all sorts of awkward things. Um, so those two questions are not necessarily related, but that's okay. One about discoverability and one about safe harbour. Please, um, who would like to have a go? John's nodding. Um. Um, let, let me address the, <coughs> excuse me, the discoverability issue. Um, the, the way that Google indexing works is highly dependent on the volume or the extent of change on a given website. So what we are finding that on BioArchive, the, uh, the Google Spider visits enormously rapidly and frequently. So the, just with simple Google searching and with Google Scholar, um, there's very rapid discoverability of newly posted work. Um, the, uh, the company Meta, which is now um, owned by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, is now uh, indexing both preprints and pu the published literature, and the major indexing services, um, all the ones that you know, um, are all deeply immersed in changing their practices to find a way of including the preprint literature in what we all conventionally use, PubMed, Scopus, Web of Science. They will have different approaches, uh, not all of them finalized, but they are very alert to the need to include pre the preprint literature in, the, in what they are doing. Thank you, so Google is already all over it and the traditional um, abstracting and indexing services are working on it, is, is your answer. More on discoverability and then also perhaps a safe harbor question. I I don't really have much on it, but I know Crossref's working on it too and trying to kind of make sure that they're indexing them as well. So I think a lot of the indexing services are sort of working on that. And, then, and to be honest, whenever I talk to researchers about how they discover things, Google comes up top. So I think you know, Google's going to find them. Good. Uh, other comments, please? Heather? No? Um, Howard, no. Anything on the safe harbor thing then? So this is the, the provision that peer review provides, peer reviewed publication provides to protect the. Mm, authors and funders of a piece of research from uh, 
I don't know, being sued for promoting a medicine before it has a license, for example, um, which is no longer uh, available from a preprint because it doesn't have peer review, right? Um, kind of seems fairly straightforward. Anyone want to comment on that? Uh, you need a mic? Well, I mean, simply to say that um, I, I, we, we understand that this is an issue um, and we haven't had any direct experience of this through BioArchive. With MedArchive, I'm sure we will. And I think at the beginning, we'll have to handle each of these instances on a case-by-case -case sort of basis until we develop some, you know, some track record. Yeah, I mean, I would say that you know, posting any of these things is always voluntary. I mean, the authors don't have to if they're concerned about that. Um, and then, um, and I think also, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're doing this with Med Archive, and I know our colleagues at The Lancet did this too. I mean, there's, a, there's an additional level, I mean, for those of you who don't know, The Lancet has a preprint server that's associated with SSRN. They've been running it and uploading submitted papers. Um, it's been very popular and successful. And um, they, I know they do quite a lot of careful vetting of the papers that go up for sort of, you know, basic ethics, and, and, and a number of them that authors want to upload don't make it past those. So I think there's, quite, there's a lot more care taken with these medical preprint servers too. Okay, good. And some of this goes, comes back to the ethics of it all as well, you know, um, which is the reason for the safe harbor thing in the first place. Um, Heather? I was just gonna say, this doesn't really go to the legality or the safe harbor issue, but again, just back to making it very clear on a preprint that this is pre-peer reviewed content so that somebody that is reading it is not trying to endorse it as peer reviewed content. Very good, thank you. Um, let's go for some more questions. So we'll, again, we'll go this side and then that side. Um, please introduce yourself and offer the question. Do you accept uh, just comments or do you need to make questions? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a comment, but okay. keep it, you know, um, not a, not a no, no, short no, comment. Clear. So my name is Rémi Mossuri, I'm a physicist and a daily user of archive for the last 20 years. And at the same time, I'm the research integrity officer for French CNRS. So I would just comment on, on this too, on this question of uh, using archive. And I think here is a debate. Among the physicist community, there is no debate, and probably among the mathematician too. I mean, we would not go back. Uh, uh, archive has, uh, is uh, widely used by large, large majority of physicists, and we see mostly only advantages of that. And, uh, it, it allows to, I mean, we believe that our colleagues are honest, but we can make honest mistakes, bad citations, uh, wrong calculations, and most of the discussion, and it was said uh, here, most of the discussion is by direct email, not by posting comment. Good. Okay, so this is for the, as a researcher, I mean, there is no debate in physics for that. And also, as a research integrity officer, I'm very happy that BioArchive is growing because uh, we have quite a lot of cases uh, with life science. And I think that not all the questions, but some of the problems uh, related to research integrity uh, can be uh, eased, if not solved, by the, the use of, uh, repeated use of BioArchive uh, system. Thank you for your comment. So, um, there are disciplines where there is no debate anymore, and that is a well-made comment. Let's go over here for a um, question. Yes, uh, it's, uh, I agree with uh, Rémi Mosri, of course. Uh, I am Michel Leduc, I am a physicist from uh, the Ethics Committee of uh, CNRS, but I have another comment, on, uh, another a question to the panel. Uh, we, we understand that more and more the scientific community is willing to make comments about articles when they are published. Uh, because uh, uh, the peer review, uh, uh, as you know, is less and less... Um, um, we are all for the peer review, but uh, it's not done perfectly more and more because we have more and more articles to review and we do it fast and publishers push us to do it very quickly and uh, the value of the peer review is declining. Everybody knows that. So, the colleagues are willing to comment on the published articles when the peer review has not been done properly. And now there are this, um, uh, you know, um, uh, on um, uh, things like PubPeer, for instance. Oh. And PubPeer uh, is on the, is not on the archive. What you? How would you? 
compare Thank the you. comments on papier Sorry. and the comments on print prints. We believe that if we could make comments on print Thank prints, you. pre or after publication, it would no. be much better than uh, reading these uh, papier yeah. articles which are more or less anonymous and more or less malevolent. Right, so that's of course, that's a, it's um, about commenting and peer reviewing, yes. and you made various assertions about the declining value of peer review and the increase in commenting online, which I would love to see backed up by numbers. Um, but let's, um, maybe we have some numbers Com from amongst the panelists here. And um, and Howard, and please um, respond well, to that. I, and I mean, I might be misrepresenting it, I alluded to it in my talk, but I think there was a recent, very recent um, article in PLOS that looked at uh, post-publication commenting in all the PLOS journals. I think PLOS biology was the best, around 20%, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but most of them were less than 10%, and most of those comments were not substantive comments. So that's the status of it. Why that is, that's a whole other debate. Uh, from my perspective as a researcher and an editor, and with a lot of experience, <laughs> both in conducting research and authoring, I think just people are overloaded. You, you know, they, they can't handle their, their daily tasks and all the formal peer reviews they're requested to do. They're not gonna find time to go comment on any old paper that's come out as a you know, post-publication commenting. And who might be commenting? That, that's also some, something that uh, could, could and is being looked into. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, Thank you. I, would say I agree completely with the idea that most of the comments you see posted on papers and preprints online are not substantive. Most of them are just kind of like, yay, nice paper, which, which is great, but it doesn't really add very much to the discussion. Um, I think the big difference with Papir is it is anonymous. Um, there's a lot of stuff on Papir, frankly, that's quite mean, and I think that's not very good. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's been a source of you know, quite a lot of angst for, pe for researchers that I know. So, so I think we have to be a little careful about that. Um, but I think, I, I also think with the commenting, but people are concerned about criticizing in public. They're concerned about ramifications for that if their name's on it. I mean, there's a real balance there between if you allow anonymous commenting, then you end up with, you can end up with the, the meanness like we get on pub here. And if you don't allow anonymous commenting, I think people are often quite inhibited about saying something other than a positive comment. Thank you. Um, go ahead, either of you. Can I just, Please, John. Can I just add something to that? Um, so to the, the questioner over here who mentioned Archive, um, there was a massive redo um, user survey of Archive done a few years ago, and one of the strong messages were from the physics community was, we do not want commenting. Um, that was interesting. We felt from the beginning of BioArchive that commenting could be potentially useful, but they, we moderate the comments. So we eliminate the nasty, the ad hominem, and the useless. <laughs> including the nice paper. Yeah. Um, and so we try, there are, you know, with the volume of papers we have, there are literally thousands and thousands of comments. Um, not all of them are exactly deep. But what's interesting is when conversations do occur, and they can be substantial, and they sort of feel a bit like peer review, only in real time, because people, you know, the authors respond, and then the commenters respond. Um, so we feel there's a sort of kernel of something useful there. We're not quite sure how to develop it, but uh, we'd like that to happen. And I do think the forces that mitigate against it are cultural rather than technological, but technology has something to do with it as well. Um, pub peer, un unfortunately, perhaps for that organization, got touched with the, the sort of tinge of malice early on in its um, operation, and I don't think it's quite lived that down yet. Um, and as I said, we go to some lens to make sure that the conversation that does take place on my archive is at least collegial. Great stuff. Anything else from the panel? No? Okay, excellent. Thank you for all of the questions so far. They've been fa fabulous. Let's hear the uh, perhaps final two questions, starting with you on the, this side, sir, and then we'll go over here. Sure. Uh, Olavo Amaral from Federal University of Rio, Brazil. Uh, I'm addressing uh, Howard's concern on fake news and on the general concern that uh, no, lack of peer review will actually expose people to bad science or unfair science. Uh, but like, what empirical evidence do we have that actually peer review uh, does that or bad science? I mean, we have a lot of, I would say you have a lot of evidence to the contrary. You have like scams, you have predatory publishers, we have uh, Andrew Wakefield's. But, but, but even if you go out of the Lancet to like, more obscure papers, I mean, 
uh, and reproducibility numbers. I mean, to me, there's accumulating empirical evidence that peer review does not really vet or bad science. So, I mean, aren't we just exposing a problem that's already out there? And might not that be a good thing? I mean, shouldn't be people, parents or patients, whatever, actually be weary of science and, and critical of what they read, no matter if it's in a preprint or in, or, or in a peer reviewed journal? I mean, are we really creating a new problem? Thank you. So I think that the, um, the question is around um, whether peer review actually does prevent or slow down the spread of GBC well, information. Also, press coverage. Too. Um, press coverage as well. And then um, a little bit of reference to shouldn't people be really um, reading things and digesting them and working out themselves anyway? So there's a sort of a fake newsy kind of question. We'll hear the um, other question over here, please, and then we'll address them. So uh, I'm Evgeny Bopov from the BIH uh, Quest Center which is a biomedical research institution. So, um, well, generally, I mean, there's a lot of merit to preprints, and especially one thing which I think hasn't even been mentioned today is that they also provide a certain version which is open access, which is not a given uh, for the postprint. Um, but I have another thing which is, is a kind of suggestion. I would be interested to hear the panel's uh, opinion. And it is because I see in all of this merit one missing link, and this is um, I think a lot of the problems and shortcomings of, uh, of preprints could be um, cut down if there would be a certain way to get information whether a paper has been later reviewed and rejected. So I think this information is missing right now and I would be interested whether you think whether there's a feasible way and then it's also used, whether this would, sorry, this would be useful to get this kind of information. Thank you. A very good question. So we have um, indicators of fake news and we have indicators of whether a paper has been peer reviewed and rejected and passed on. Can so I Debbie talk about first, the press please, coverage yeah. thing? Because it is a really important question. It's one that we struggle with because we've put a lot of time and effort and I think you know, a number of other journals do put a lot of time and effort into trying to sort of um, get information out to reporters so they can write responsibly about science. We write you know, press releases that we work on very carefully to make sure that they're responsible. We have an embargo system. We, we're trying very hard to do what we can to promote you know, responsible journalism about science. And, um, and for me personally, I feel like you know, public understanding of science and public appreciation of science is really important. And I think if we, if we lose that system or if we end up in a system where people will... I mean, I've, I've seen examples of where a journalist picked up a preprint and wrote an article based on talking to the authors and frankly, the, the article like way overstated what the paper actually said and it was kind of outrageous. And, and I thought if that had been a press release that we put out, we wouldn't have done that. So, so I think um, I do worry about those kind of situations. And it creates a real struggle for our press office who are really trying to do a good job of promoting responsible coverage of science. So, Good stuff, thank you. Others? John, you have the mic. Go. So to Debbie's point about press coverage, I mean, we, we, can't not, we can't forget that we are still in the very, very early days as far as the growth of preprints for many disciplines uh, is concerned. So. There's a huge amount of education to be done of, of, of researchers, of students, of journalists to get the point across that Debbie has just made that they should not be writing stories about a preprint as if this is gospel. And in fact, no responsible journalist really, as a professional science journalist, would never write a story about a paper without checking um, alternative sources alternative to the authors anyway. So they shouldn't, you know, there, they, there is a lot, there is irresponsible journalism done and preprints are part of that. Um, I, I'd like to go back to your point about peer reviews, but Howard. No, it's just that, you know, I was very careful what's about saying that, uh, of course, you know, uh, fake news can be generated from any source, but uh, uh, on average, you know, uh, peer review removes more errors than no peer review at all. And, and, and uh, <laughs> yes, so, uh, so I, I'm saying we should, we should do things that improve the situation, and I don't see an argument that preprints improve the situation. They don't improve the situation, no way. So they make it worse, they make it worse. They put more unvetted documents out there. Thank you. Um, can, yeah. can I yeah, pick up the peer review thing? thing. Final question for yeah. Anna um, so to the, your point about peer review, um, I share your skepticism about peer review as a, a, a complete sort of enterprise. It all depends on how it's done. 
And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work for and run journals that do peer review in a very serious, detailed way that benefits authors very considerably. But there are tens of thousands of journals in the world, and not all of them do that. So we can't make these blanket statements about peer review, either pro or con. No, I know, that's true. And we should also address the other question about, you know, should something that's a preprint be labeled as when it's been rejected from a journal? And I think it's one of these things that you think in principle, oh, wouldn't that be interesting and nice to know? But I'm sure it, if it's your paper, you wouldn't yeah. be so keen. So let's, let's <laughs> always... So, you know. Yeah, well, so exactly, we, I know, because so a lot of people say that they're... always so, you know, important that we I mean, remember... People, People really worry when they're submitting to journals that the journal won't know that it's been rejected yeah. from another journal because they're worried about that. They're worried about the perceptions and they're also, and a lot of times when people's papers get rejected, they feel that they're rejected unfairly. So I think, um, I, I think that is, I mean, it's the same as when, when we've looked at people getting comments on their articles and they, you know, they love, in principle, they love the idea of upvotes and downvotes until they, the concept of a downvote on their paper comes up and suddenly they're not yeah. quite so keen. So, so I think it's um, that kind of situation. I, I was going to say something similar in response to your point about um, flagging or badging preprints as uh, to their sort of current status in, in the, their journey to, to one hopes to publication. And my colleague Richard Seberg uh, coined the term the metadata of failure. Nobody yeah, wants their manuscript to be touched with yeah. the metadata of failure. I think that's a but great you phrase. You also want to avoid, you know, the possibility that somebody puts something that they just kind of give up on, on a preprint server. I mean, kind of be silly to do that, but you never know. <laughs> but so, so, I mean, like something that's been rejected five times. So we've um, really hit the end of our allotted slots. Anna, I'm so sorry that we're not going to come to your question. Um, you stood there so patiently. Um, one of the things that's just become quite, it's a very animated part of the discussion, is when we think about actually what happens to researchers or research authors and how they respond to particular situations and you know, how they respond to particular situations as peer reviewers. And we have this tendency to you know, consider all peer review to be alike and all researchers to be alike. And I think that's well, clearly not the case, right? There are um, thousands of different kinds of research and researcher and loads of different ways of doing peer review. And perhaps that's the message here is that diversity and coexistence and making decisions that are right for individual research communities is what's quite important, and we should probably all take that um, home with us. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here and for joining in so um, well, actively. It's been a really fantastic session, but most of all, I'd like to thank our very wonderful panelists. Please give them all a round of applause. Thank you.